Small business is about courage, risk-taking, independence, and we small business owners are survivors. Everybody has an idea for a business, but how do you take that idea from mind to market? This is the place to learn. Small Business School with Hattie Bryant. It's a new kind of school. Together we'll learn about business from the inside out, from the people who've done it. We'll meet the men and women who are today's pioneers and quiet heroes. Their lives are the textbooks. Our classroom is the world. Hi, I'm Hattie Bryant. What is it about leadership that is so difficult to describe and define? There are dozens of books about it and hundreds of gurus who speak about it, and you would think that by now everyone would know what it is. Every business owner who has been on our program is a leader, but when it comes to explaining why they are so effective, it's difficult. In our work to produce video companions for some 30 college and graduate school textbooks, we've had the pleasure of reading and talking with many authors. Today you'll meet Dr. Keith Grint, who will help us understand this large word, leadership. We now know how to recognize it. In 30 minutes, you'll know too. As Dr. Grant talks with us about power, charisma, communication, and motivation, we'll take you to meet effective small business owners who are truly leaders. Our guest has published seven books and over 40 articles on topics ranging from business process reengineering to appraisal schemes, organizational theory, and sociology of work. His current research focuses on leadership. We went to the Saeed Business School, Templeton College, Oxford, to meet Dr. Keith Grant, its director of research. There's, a, there's an argument that leadership can either be about positions or it can be a process, which is a, a different kind of way of understanding this. There is some degree of control generated by your position, but I think it's also worth considering whether, in fact, leadership is to do with a process rather than a position. That is to say that um, you might want to argue that anybody who persuades somebody else to do something they wouldn't have otherwise done is taking a leadership role. Okay. What is power? Power is not so much a possession but a relationship. It's not so much a cause but a consequence. When your boss says jump, what tends to happen is you think about it and you think about whether you should jump or not. They can't make you do these things. There's almost no instance where somebody can coerce you into doing something. You might want to argue that if somebody points a gun to your head and says, if you don't do this, I'm going to kill you, you don't have any choice. But you still have a choice. You can say, go pull the trigger. So you still have a choice about doing this. So in this instance, what subordinates do um, appears to me to be um, very influential in establishing whether the leader has power or not. So to put that another way around, if a leader says jump and the subordinates jump, then leaders have power. Not before it, but after the event. So power becomes a consequence rather than a cause of subordinate action. Uh, the, that's, a, that's a complete reversal of our normal assumptions about power. And that explains why I think negotiations are so important for leaders. Because by and large, they have to negotiate their way through organisational control. You can't simply say, I'm the boss, you must do it. You can say, I'm the boss. If you do it, I'll pay you, or if we do this together, we might achieve something. If you were to push me into say which is the most important skill of leadership, I would suggest probably negotiating, it sits very high up on those skills. Is the biggest flaw you see in most leaders arrogance? Yeah, I think it's an issue that um, arrogant people tend to assume that they, in, in some sense, are an extreme version of everywhere, everybody else. So what motivates them motivates other people, but they're just better at it. So if you're motivated by money, that means everybody else must be motivated by money. So I think we, we tend to assume that um, whatever intrigues us intrigues other people. So if you extrapolate that and put it down to a leadership role, what motivates other people it motivates me. And of course that isn't the case because many leaders are quite different from their employers or their subordinates. So almost by definition, uh, in this instance, leaders need to think beyond themselves. And to do that, they need to engage in conversations with their subordinates. Dr. Grant said, leaders need to think beyond themselves. This is the difference between a business owner who grows a business and the business owner who stays small. 
which is... While most of her industry is stuck in the past, Pam McNair is the perfect example of the leader who is thinking beyond herself. When we started, we had uh, just a full service salon. Pam McNair is founder of Gadabout Salon and Spas. She has created 225 jobs and millions in sales. How did she do it? She's your neighbor next door who mastered the art of team building. Pam builds things as a team. This whole company is probably a team. So the office naturally falls into that, that everybody's always bouncing everything off of everybody. Our marketing ideas come up probably through excitement. She's totally invested in the people who work for her. She works for the people who work for her. I think you have to look at the all over picture, check and see if your mission and your vision is there, and then you need to get out of the way. You need to be able to delegate with a design so that other people can duplicate what you do. Okay. Or do it better. And I'm not the star, I build stars. So it allows other people to be in the forefront and it allows me to be, have the time to do what I need to do to make them look better and to be better. Conventionally, we distinguish between hierarchies and anarchies. I, hierarchy would be formal positions of power in a particular organization, whereas anarchy would be the absence of formal positions of power, nobody in control. Um, I think if you look at the historical record, there are no organizations that persist across time successfully that are run as anarchies. They are all, to some extent, hierarchical. But the question is, what kind of hierarchy do you have? Now, um, one way of understanding this would be to think about heterarchies. A heterarchy is a movable hierarchy where um, people would replace leaders on a temporary basis. This would be the kind of equivalent of a, a research team or a, a project team where different people would take positions of power at, for, uh, for more appropriate um, roles given their expertise. And you can see this in, in all kinds of small informal groups where different people play different roles of leadership. Um, they are better understood as heterarchies than as hierarchies. Okay. And so how big is the house? Many strong companies like E.M. Rose Builders operate as heterarchies. The right talent is assembled project by project. Miriam Webster says a heterarchy is a form of organization resembling a network or fishnet, and authority is determined by knowledge and function. Okay. okay. Employees at Altoon and Porter have their own chair and computer, but move to new desks when assigned a new project. Renegade Animation taps particular talent for particular jobs. Gosho Architects is all about everyone's best ideas being brought forward. Hello, people. And the same is true at Boardroom Inc. A different way of putting that would be that they are engaged in deep leadership. That is to say, leadership occurs throughout the organization and is not constrained to the formal positions in a hierarchy. What I'm suggesting is uh, two things. One is the formal leaders need to be constrained by their subordinates who are willing. This is another way of putting this would be to talk about um, them being um, constructive dissenters people who, are, who have the best interest of the organization at heart, i.e. they're constructive, but they're happy to dissent from the main ideals of the organization or the decision-making of the organization, which is the reverse of destructive consenters, people who are willing to say, yes, of course, that's right, knowing that it's actually not the right way to go about things. Most organizations are full of destructive consenters, yes people, as opposed to constructive dissenters who are the thorns in people's sides that are actually very unpopular but necessary to keep an organization from going in the wrong direction. You need to surround yourself with a group of people who are willing to tell you when you're going wrong. I said, you know, Wing can't tie his shoes. He can't barely get his hair combed out or anything. He's, he's, he's disorganized, but he's a great marketing man. The one thing that he does, he does better than anyone alive. The cool fact Ed is Wing Lamb's younger brother, and Wing is the force behind Wahoo's Fish Taco, their 22 location surfer food joint. All traditional leadership roles were thrown out the window by these three brothers because they were more interested in success than their own egos. The baby brother Mingo is the CEO, and they recruited a fourth partner, Steve Carferitas, a Greek with five-star restaurant systems experience, to be the COO. How many students are studying business? 
the basic assumption is that all leaders are flawed. By definition, we are all flawed to some extent. Therefore, all leaders must be flawed. Therefore, they cannot be perfect leaders. They must be imperfect. They must make mistakes. So the, the problem is not whether you can get a perfect leader, because you can't. The problem is, how do you stop an imperfect leader making too many mistakes that threaten the organization? And that's a big problem for leaders across space and time, is that as they get more senior in the organization, they tend to assume that they are probably the person most equipped to take the decisions in that organization. And therefore, the advice that they get from other people will not be adequate. Therefore, they'll take more decisions on their own. Or they surround themselves with sycophants, with people who are simply yes people, as we would call them now. The consequence of all of that is that you tend to get poorer and poorer decision making mm -hmm. as you go up organizations, unless you take Castiglione's advice to heart and find somebody or a group of people who are happy to tell you when you're going wrong and you don't threaten them when they do tell you that. You don't shoot the messenger. At strong, small companies, the first thing like everyone has a seat at the table. The Owners shoulder the financial burden, but they seek ideas from everyone on the payroll. Rather than attempting to actually go to the... The most important aspect to think about in communications is the difference between transmission and exchange models. Transmission models of communication are the equivalent of a lecture. So if I'm giving you a lecture, I'm talking at you, not talking with you. And the consequence of that, all the research that we know about transmission models suggests that people don't listen to very much of what anybody else is, is saying. So within 10 minutes, most people are asleep. Now, by and large, transmission models of communication fail, but that's what is used most by most leaders most of the time. So they send you the corporate video, or they give you the corporate lecture, or they talk at you, or they shout at you, or whatever it is that they do, and we don't listen. A different way of thinking about the communication would be an exchange model. Now, rather than uh, the transmission model where it's one-to-one, -one, but it's a kind of hierarchical relationship, Exchange model is not a hierarchical relationship, it's an egalitarian relationship. So we speak with people, we speak with our friends. Um, and in this sense, what we're doing is we're exchanging communication, we're exchanging information. This is where the Latin word comes from, it's about exchange. It's not about transmission of information, it's the exchange of information. And we know that when people are communicating in an exchange method, that far more of that communication is actually retained. So it's a, it's a far more effective way of learning, which is why we know that lectures, by and large, don't work. But if we engage in a conversation about something, more of the information is exchanged and more seeps in and more is retained. So um, if you're thinking about leadership and communication, what you want to do is move away from a transmission model wherever possible and try to get into an exchange method. It's much more time intensive. It's much more difficult to do, but it works compared to a transmission model. Even though Dr. Grant told us he didn't have much to say about communication, what he did say is powerful. Here's Sora Vasugi, founder of Ziba Design, demonstrating the exchange model. One of my golden rules is that what is good for the goose is good for the gander. Whatever is good for me should be good for the next person. If you want them to feel like this is their own company, give them what they, you have. This is really nice. I mean, the way it tapers down to uh, that's nice. He is the Elvis of industrial design. Young people all over the world want to work here, and when they arrive, they are shocked to find this famous man sitting quietly in the corner in the same room with all the other designers. He's always asking and nearly never telling. Well, it's great to have a leader that you can go to and throw these creative ideas off of and really gets it. as well as members of the university. That the hubris of leadership is, an, is basically the issue. And, and what occurs across time, leaders become more and more arrogant. And the problem with arrogance is that people who are arrogant surround themselves with people who don't challenge their arrogance. Mm -hmm. And it's the absence of a challenge which becomes the problem. Uh, and it's a, it's a difficult thing for any of us to encourage people to challenge us. It's not comfortable to be challenged. So unless you're an unusual leader, you tend to surround yourself with people who don't challenge you. Right, and, and then you get boards of people, boards of directors or whatever, who are willing to acquiesce to a leader's decision, whether it's good or bad. 
Well, I think it's a very fine line between being confident and being arrogant. There are very few people who are confident enough not to be arrogant. I want to play. These are the faces of confidence, not arrogance. Ken Doan, Australia's most famous painter. Pamela Rogers, owner of Rogers Chevrolet, a rare woman with an MBA who was succeeding in a male-dominated industry. Gil Harper, owner of Weather End, makers of fine outdoor furniture. And Tracy Myers, an entrepreneur who built a business for 20 years, then sold it for millions. I think the whole area of um, business encourages people who are going to be arrogant and confident and brash. You would not probably get very many people who are shy and retiring to be CEOs of major companies. There's an interesting book by Jim Collins who talks about um, level five leadership and I think what, what um, Collins is saying is that bizarrely the most successful long-term businesses are actually run by people who are personally modest as opposed to personally arrogant. Dr. Grant is leaning hard on the arrogant because he is convinced that business is an environment that has in the past rewarded arrogant behavior. We agree, but we also know many company founders who are humble, soft-spoken, and kind. Steve Hoffman's patience and focus have attracted loyal customers and employees. See for yourself what a self-effacing leader can do. <laughs> Fortunately, we started with technology first. When we went to Modern Postcard, the only way that we could do it was to have everything internal be digitized. Everything, everything was digital from the very beginning with Modern Postcard. Steve Hoffman is founder and owner of Modern Postcard. He has 250 employees who produce over 100 million postcards a year for some 150,000 customers. Steve explains some of his techniques for managing the explosive growth. The way that these work is, is that each person that comes in to a, into a brainstorming session basically can have an idea. It's a, so we can just repurpose a lot of existing content that we have. Then you can start to use the group method in terms of understanding how it all goes together and get buy-in from everybody within a very short period of time. And this is based on something called? The theory of constraints. Okay, and what does that mean? Uh, the theory of constraints is a system, it's basically a thinking process system in terms of how we think and how we, how, how we can pull a lot of different, very complex ideas and concepts together into, into a single cohesive thought that everybody understands. First of all, I think that business is actually pretty straightforward, very simple. You know, it's, it, you're there to serve the customer. Um, it's not about greed, it's not about um, the, big, the big car. <laughs> big car, it's not about complicated formulas. You're really there to serve the customer and, and really to put them before yourself. So don't worry if you're not dynamic and bubbling with charisma. Dr. Grant says it is the leader who can install systems to get things done who will make the greatest impact over the long haul. Benjamin Franklin is not a charismatic creature, but he's also extraordinarily good at getting things done. And that's about taking decisions, taking risks, getting things to work, and engaging other people in those activities. You don't need to be Gandhi or Jesus Christ to get something done. You just need to take a leadership decision. So I, th I think if I, was, if I was to end up with a kind of positive framework, it's to, it's to forget some of these concerns about whether I have the 25 characteristics that I need to have to be God's gift to business. So you might think you're charismatic, but if nobody else does, you're not charismatic. On the other hand, if you don't think you're charismatic, but everybody else does, you are charismatic. So there's an argument about whether charisma is something which people have as a possession, a personal characteristic or competence, or whether charisma is an attribute. It's something which followers give to particular leaders. Two quite different ways of thinking about charisma. Uh, sociologically, most of the early work on charisma came from Weber, Max Weber, German sociologist, beginning of the last century. Um, his argument is that there are actually very few and far between charismatics around at any time. Um, charismatics for him are really quite superhuman. They're very unusual characters. They have very unusual qualities. They come at the time of crisis. They offer followers a resolution to a long-standing problem uh, and they lead 
in the sense that charisma is something um, which encourages followers to lead without coercion. So as far as Weber is concerned, charisma is the only non-coercive form of power because followers follow charismatics because they want to, not because they have to. You know, why would you want to be more charismatic? What makes you want to follow somebody who is charismatic? And one of the concerns about charisma is it seems to me to relate to a notion of um, irresponsible followership. In that sense that I'm talking about irresponsibility, it's about hoping that this charismatic is going to solve my problems for me. So I'm no longer responsible for solving these problems because somebody else is going to do it and that somebody is charismatic and that's why I'm following them. So if things go wrong, they're to blame. So what are we to think at the end of this book about our own potential? The thousands and thousands of students that are studying this book, do we all have potential for leadership? Well, I, I think everybody does have potential for leadership. I think everybody is a leader and will become a leader at some point and some time. You don't have to be in a position of leadership to demonstrate leadership. By and large, the organizations that seem to me to be the most successful in the long term are full of people who are leaders. They're not all designated as leaders, but they're all doing leadership things. Let's see, every machine, every part along the way, every, every little thing has to be perfect. At Record Technology, by listening to customers, the employees together came up with the company's best-selling product. It makes our customers, when they come in here, At feel Black like Diamond, owner Peter Medcalf depends upon the team to make things work. So we will have something real good to test. What, are you, what kind of feedback are you getting? Good. At Cowgirl Enterprises, group think is a priority. And at KMP Internet, many heads are considered superior to one. Is there a difference between a manager and a leader? Is that the dull, boring, most ordinary question in the whole world? Well, no, it's not necessarily dull and boring. It's very controversial, and there's lots of people who have written about it. I mean, my, for what it's worth, I think there is a problem in differentiating between management and leadership because the more you differentiate, the more the interesting things get put on with leadership and the more the boring bits get put on with management. The consequence of all that is that if you're just designated as a manager, you're a nobody, you're going nowhere. Uh, but if you're a leader, then you get all the responsibility and all the rewards. And I think um, organizations that succeed need to have people who are managing as well as people who are leading. And I really think that we need to stop, in some ways, bifurcating this between management and leadership and putting both of, perhaps differentiating between administration and leadership and putting them both under the tool or the label of management. So we have management at the top, everybody's a manager, and within that you all have to lead and you all have to do some administration. So there are some very interesting leaders who are totally inept at administration who can sell you all kinds of visions but have absolutely no way of knowing how to get to where you want to go. So they're as problematic as people who don't have any vision at all. So I'm, I'm um, not a great fan of the distinction between management and leadership and the more we talk about just leadership being important, the more difficult it becomes to manage. I don't think the vision thing is a big thing. I don't think that's a big deal. It doesn't take very long or a great deal of imagination to imagine the vision. What's difficult is how do you get from the vision to wherever it is you want to go to? So how do you get from A to B? If you look at the list of characteristics that you need to be a successful leader, the only one that really matters is that you need to be successful. The rest can just follow from that. So this is a kind of reversal of the listing process. The listings are irrelevant. There are lots of people I know who are successful leaders who have none of those competencies, but they're successful. And that's the only one that you need to have. And we've met scores of successful leaders, business owners, and the people who work with them to bring quality products and services to the market. They're not afraid to lead us into a better world. We now have it straight. Leaders must manage and managers must lead. As business owners, we can't run and hide. We have a position of power, whether we like it or not. From that position, we can build by installing systems, listening and respecting others, and most importantly, thinking beyond ourselves. That's leadership. We'll see you next time.
Small Business School with Hattie Bryant. If you want to learn more about starting, running, and growing a business, come to our website, smallbusinessschool.org. There are streaming video and interactive study guides. The only way we can compete with big business is to be faster, smarter, and better. We are the engine of the American economy. We create the jobs. Small business is about big commitment. It's about sacrifice and struggle. But we do it because we say, if I don't do 